And uh, so this morning we are going to be talking about contending for the faith. And I pray that as I'm speaking to genuine contenders of the faith rather than what I mentioned a few weeks ago, last day's pretenders, of which there are many, I wish to remind us of what actually contending for the faith is, what are we contending for, and equally important, how we ought to be going about the business of contending for the faith. The how is imperative. The how is extremely important. The manner in which we contend for the faith is paramount, and that's what I want to focus on this morning. For the fashion in which the church of the last few decades anyway, by my observation, has understood what contending is, and in our day, in the name of apologetics, which is becoming very popular, and especially the manner in which it is carried out, for the most part, is not how God would have it to be. People, in the name of apologetics, contending for the faith, and the manner in which it is carried out, for the most part today, is not being carried out in a godly manner, and it's not accomplishing anything. Why? Because very often contending for the faith inside of Christian circles is understood in secular carnal terms. When we think about contending, it's natural that we think via our flesh in that regard, and this is what we think of, right? Putting on boxing gloves and going after it. Uh, we can't think of contending for the faith inside of secular carnal terms and carry it out in an equally carnal, combative way. Again, we're going to accomplish nothing. will cause more harm than good. Apologetics typically today has become this. A battle between self-proclaimed, for the most part, intellectuals. That's what it's become. If you know anything about apologetics and defending the faith, especially in our day, it's become nothing more than a battle between self-proclaimed intellectuals or people who are actually intellectual. And if the opponent, the person that they are arguing with about certain Bible doctrines, etc., is not to their level in the way of being an intellectual, the lesser person of the two is just seen as an idiot and wrong. End of story. That's kind of the attitude inside of modern day apologetics and it's totally ungodly. The faking, the understanding, and the execution of today's carnally minded Laodicean church leads to nothing but contention. Contending for the faith wrongly leads to nothing but contention. Right? I, I would submit that that's the truth, and I would hope yeah. that you would see enough to believe, or that you would see enough of what's going on to believe that what I'm saying is true. Contending for the faith in that manner, in a combative, carnal way, is actually a blight on the testimony of the church that we're attempting to stand up for and the doctrines that we stand on inside of that church. If we're to please God and actually lead people to him effectively, we must learn to contend for the faith without being contentious. Have you ever entered a biblical discussion with someone and it turned out being contentious? Anybody besides me? You're, you're privileged if you haven't. I've been in a lot of spiritual discussions where at the end of it, it did not turn out well. It just became very contentious. That's the wrong way to contend for the faith. Regretfully, the church has, not the church as a whole, but the church in large anyway, has taken on the mind and the ways of the world, and it's become nothing more than all about debate and argument and proving a particular point. All with, and if you've been where I have, you know this is true, all with a hateful, belligerent, arrogant, in-your-face way of doing so. Again, don't raise your hands, but I suspect by people shaking their heads that some people here know what I'm talking about. Again, this is not what it is to contend.
in for the faith as a Christian, if you haven't noticed, if you're open your eyes and pay attention, it doesn't work. It hasn't worked, and it never will work. Never, and I'm emphasizing never, never has the gospel been advanced in an attempt to defend the gospel via the world's way of contending for it. Never, and I emphasize again the word never, never has the cause of Christ been positively promoted by opposing the enemies of the cross via satanic strife. It doesn't work. Such argument or defense of God, Christ, the gospel, and the Bible only hinders and prohibits any good from being accomplished. Consider the following. Don't take my word for it. Let's go to the Bible. The Bible says this in Jude 3 and 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. So we are told here that we are to earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Why? Because there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This earnestly contending for the faith, of course, in one way, obviously refers to the race the spiritual race that we're all engaged in. And so that being said, I will encourage all of us as Christians and as a church to earnestly run. When we're talking about contending for the faith and one application of that being applied to the <coughs> overall race that we're in, spiritual race in this life, run. Run earnestly. Why? So as the Bible says, so that we may obtain the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But... When it tells us to earnestly contend for the faith, can it also be referring to making an argument for truth? Yes. Does it also mean that we are to defend the gospel and take a stand for and defend pure biblical doctrine? Yes. Absolutely so, that's what it means. And the best way to do so, what I'm going to say is extremely elementary. It's almost overly obvious, but it is the simple truth. The best way to do so, to defend the gospel, to defend biblical doctrine, the very best way is simply by highlighting the Word of God and continuing to highlight the Word of God. And if you're reading between the lines here of what I'm saying, I'm saying highlight the word of God, not the word of man, not the interpretation of man. Just continue highlighting the word of God. That alone is how we best defend the Bible. It's how we best define the doctrines of the word of God. It's how we best defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's word not just spoken, but repeatedly spoken, and just as imperatively and importantly demonstrated by our testimony and our life in the ears and in the eyes of those that would pervert or attempt to destroy it, is how we go about it. What? Contending for the faith properly. And on our part, it's to do so, again, without being contentious or contrary in our attitude. How many times do we back this? How many times do staunch, independent, fundamental Baptists refrain from being contentious and contrary when they're standing up for truth? If you've been around like I have, it seems that's all it is. Oh, they're standing up for truth, all right, but in a very contrary and contentious manner. Their attitude just plain Things, and it's ungodly, and it's not how we go about doing so. Not saying don't contend for the faith, don't stand up for truth, just do so. 
without being contentious and contrary. We can absolutely, Christian, be firm. We can absolutely be unyielding. I hope you're hearing me. Firm and unyielding in our stand for Jesus Christ. We can be very firm and very unyielding concerning biblical truth, but we must be so in the spirit of Christ. We must go about it in the spirit of Christ. Our contending is to be in gentleness and meekness and patience and understanding and love. It defies human thinking. It defies secular thinking. And it honestly defies modern day church apologetics going at it that way. But we must. To attempt to contend with error in the spirit of uncharitableness, hatred, pride, and even arrogant bigotry is not the character nor the manner of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And I hope we don't go down that road. The world's style of fighting for what they believe in, as well as that of today's misguided, mistaught Christians, only tears down and destroys. It doesn't do anything positive. It, you may think by you contending for the faith, I mean standing for what you believe in, and to the nth degree you're going at it like this with the people that are opposing you is going to lead to some good. You're wrong. It's not going to lead to a lick of good. It will only tear down and destroy. If nothing else, the relationship you're trying to gain with that other person you're talking to. Can I just tell you how I am personally? You get in my face and get all bent out of shape and anger, guess how many times in the future past that I want to interact with you? None. None. I have no desire to interact with people whose only objective and agenda is to prove their point to me. They have no interest in listening to my side. They're only trying to prove their point, and they do it in a, this kind of manner. I'm done. I'm done. I'm not talking to that person anymore. End of story. I've got more important things to do. I've got better ways to spend my time, and I've got other people who are worthy to engage with to engage with. That's just how I am. I suspect most humans are the same way. Not going to get anywhere getting in someone's face and trying to drive a point down their throat, right? It's going nowhere. <laughs> a rightful contending for the faith, though, fortifies and builds up. A rightful contention for the faith does just the opposite. When you go at it in the spirit of Jesus Christ, it has just the opposite effect, a positive effect. Someone said this, if you're called by God... To tear down error, and it seems like that's some people's calling. I know people like that right now. I can name names of people who believe their calling is to tear down error. They spend their entire lives just tearing down what they believe is usually how it plays out. What they believe is error in the church, in the Bible, about the Bible, etc., 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 Someone said, if you're called by God to, tap, to tear down error, go ahead and do it. But be sure to spend just as much time building people up in the truth. That doesn't happen when you go about contending for the faith with a contentious and contrary heart and attitude. You can't pull it up. So whether we find ourselves having to contend inside the church, and sadly that's how it plays out sometimes, sometimes... You have to actually contend for the faith inside the body of believers that you're going to church with every Sunday, sadly. So whether it's contending for the faith inside the church or outside of the church, wrongful contention will always and only ever lead to chaos. It will lead to chaos. Titus chapter 2 says this. It tells us, Christian, speak thou... We are to speak. We are to defend. We are to stand up for. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Okay, that's a given. Pay attention to this verse. In all, while you're speaking, in your effort to speak truth, as we should, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of, of good works. It's referring to your attitude while you're speaking. 
the manner in which you do so. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. I hope you're reading what the Word of God is telling us here. As you're speaking and defending truth and defending the gospel and defending Jesus Christ, or maybe a better way to put it is to, while you're standing up for Christ, while you're standing up for Jesus and the gospel and the Word, our speech should be speech driven by a heart that is right before God as we're walking in the spirit of Christ and God at the same time, something that should not be condemned, right? By God and or by others. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say about you. Think about that last phrase. You see, a pure, holy, godly life and testimony, and that testimony being more than just verbal, I hope you understand that our visible testimony speaks much, much louder than our verbal one does. Would you agree with me on that? We can tell people we love God. We can tell people we love them. We can tell people that we're Christians, that we're disciples of Jesus Christ. But if our lifestyle doesn't back it up, you know what the end result of that is, right? We're seen as nothing more than a hypocrite. Just like most unsafe people think church is full of only hypocrites. And honestly, as I've said a couple weeks ago, they have good reason to believe that. And that's because there are many, 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 many hypocrites that attend church services every week. Hypocritical in this way. They say one thing and live another. They say one thing and act another. It's spiritual Christian hypocrisy, and uh, I hope we're never guilty of it. May our, may our testimony visible be back up and be even louder than our testimony verbal. Anyway, it's by a pure holy, godly life and testimony, verbal and visible, that itself, itself, just your testimony, a means of defending truth and opposing error and evil and wickedness. Here's what I'm saying. There are times where you don't even have to intentionally or purposefully engage in a verbal conversation with anybody whatsoever to defend your faith. Did you know that you can defend the faith? You can stand up for Jesus and the Bible and everything that goes along with this thing we call Christianity without ever uttering the word? Did you know that? Your testimony alone at times, if not more often than not, is what God will use in you to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Proverbs 28 says this. They, th here's what I'm saying in verse 4. They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. Here is how I'm going to put this verse 4. You're a Christian, or a professing one anyway, go ahead and buy your testimony by your lifestyle, live in a way contrary to the way that God wants you to and per his word. In other words, you're forsaking the law of God, right? You know God wants you to do this on any given day during your life as a Christian, but you just don't. You just refuse to obey the word of God as a professing Christian and do no differently than the world would do. Well, here's what the Bible says. Go ahead, professing Christian, and forsake the law of God. By default, without ever saying anything, just by your testimony, what are you doing? You're praising the wicked. You're, you're condoning the wicked by acting no differently than them. But if you keep the law, meaning you strive to obey and adhere to the word of God, and the commandments set forth in it for how we're to conduct ourselves as believers, 
By default, what are we doing? Contending with the wicked. Let me tell you this. You, you will be the enemy of the wicked so long as you live like Jesus Christ, by default. Right? You're not going to have to try to contend with them. You, by your testimony alone, will be contending with them. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. It makes sense to me. If not, we'll move on. Consider the following scripture when you think of engaging and contending with others over the faith. I've mentioned that when we go about contending for the faith in a contentious, combative way, that that is the unbiblical way to do so. The verses I'm going to share prove it. Colossians 4, 6. In context of us talking about and thinking about contending for the faith, uh, if you are one of the elite intellectuals today that are hung up on apologetics, then just think of it in that way. Let your speech be always, your speech is, this speech encompasses everything we say. With anybody we're talking to, anytime. Let your speech, whatever comes out of your mouth, whether you're contending for the faith, whether you're just having a general conversation with uh, Tom down at the hardware store or Susie at the grocery store, it doesn't matter. Let your speech, whatever proceeds out of your mouth, be always with what? Grace. If what's coming out of your mouth and the manner in which you're attempting to converse with someone is harsh and rude and belligerent and arrogant, is that speech graceful speech? No, it's not. Let your speech, especially inside of contending for the faith, people know you're a Christian by your testimony. What are they going to think of you, Christian, if when trying to defend your Christianity, you act like the devil himself inside of the conversation with other people? It's not going to go anywhere. Let your speech be always seasoned, or be always with grace, seasoned with what? Salt. In other words, let our speech be savory. I'm, I'm a foodie. I'm a foodie nut. I love food. I've always said if I could just have one big vacation for a year, it would be to travel the entire world, as many places in the world as I could go. Not just to experience culture and scenery, maybe disturbingly to you, more than even culture and scenery, you want to know what? Food! I would love to taste the foods of the world. I just love eating different kinds of food that way. Okay, I love food. Bring it back to home. I don't like unsavory food. Thank the Lord, I don't have a health condition which prohibits me from eating salt. So I put salt on everything I eat. And it's not just table salt. For you food aficionados, I use uh, fleur de sel. Does anybody know what that is? No one knows what that is? It's a French term for salt flour translated uh, directly. It's a different kind of salt that you have to buy kind of special, and uh, it's more of a moist flake salt. And it just makes things taste a thousand times better than regular table salt. If you don't know what it is, come to my house and I'll show you the difference. It's worth the extra couple bucks to buy it that way. Take a picture of it. Take a picture of it. I'll send it to everybody in a text this week. But, okay, we'll do. Harry started this cooking thing. All right, I'll bring you some some from the coast of France, Claire de Sel, next week, so you can try it on some food. Okay. Anyway, here's what I'm trying to say. Any food that's just good is better with salt, in my opinion. Salt makes good food taste better. There's no question about it. It's what salt does. Salt enhances flavor. Think of it when we're talking about what comes out of our mouth, right? Think of it inside of us contending for the faith and standing up for Jesus Christ and attempting to bring others to the truth of what the Word of God has to say. 
If our speech, and even more importantly, the manner behind it, isn't salty, it's going to be unsavory to the people you're trying to get to swallow. I hope, again, in my simple childlike terms, you understand what not I'm trying to convey, but what God's trying to convey. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you might know how you ought to answer every man. Pay attention to this verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Here we go again, before we even attempt to speak, I hope that we sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. We do know that what comes out of the mouth is first what's in the heart, right? And so if we're not walking in the Spirit and our heart is not in tune with God, then what comes out and the manner in which those words come out is not going to be godly. And so let's sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Yes, always ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. This is where apologetics gets its verse from. This is where they stand. And I'm not against apologetics, by the way. I am against the manner in which it's carried out. And I think we kind of leave out this last little phrase. It's okay to have a defense of the gospel, have an answer when people ask you why you believe what you believe, etc., etc., to have an answer for them. But let that answer be given in meekness and in fear. Our heart attitude being key. Our heart's attitude being holy before God. Ephesians 4.29 is self-explanatory. Back to all of our speech being seasoned with salt and grace. Here's kind of the flip side of that. With whatever comes out of our mouth, may none of it be corrupt. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Instead... Here's what should be coming. That, by our words, even by our testimony, this is the message we're, we're to convey to those that we're talking to, that it can be used for good to the use of edifying the other person. What's that word edify mean? Build up. That's correct. So that it will build the person up, not tear the person down. So it'll build the relationship we have with other people that we're talking to up instead of down. This happens every day, sadly, in church. Conversations happen between two Christians, two professing Christians, that are on opposing sides of something, and the contention occurs inside of contending for the faith, and division happens, right? There's no building up. It becomes a tearing down. It becomes a tearing down of relationship between people. And then if it goes beyond that, there's a division in the church, right? A split happens all over wrongful contending for the faith. Because we've been led to believe that as Baptists, that means we got our gloves on and we're going after it, man. You, hey, here, bang, bang. I'll show you what I believe in. I'll show you where I stand. Wrong way. Might be okay for Muhammad Ali to do that. It's not okay for us Christians to go at it that way. Jesus Christ has changed the way things are done. He tells us, love our enemies, right? He tells us, turn the other cheek. You're going to follow Christ? It's going to be a radical change for you, and it's going to be a change that other people will call you foolish for following it. So be it. Christians will tell you you're foolish for actually following Jesus Christ and the principles he sets forth in his word. Don't listen to people. Don't worry about it. Don't do things the way they do it. Do things the way Jesus wants us to. Right? So when you contend for the faith, and that's something we should do, just go about it properly. And everything will turn out hunky dory the other way around, not so much. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of that, find that it may minister, again, grace to the hearers. People should leave a conversation with us, even if they still disagree with us, thinking about what we said, 
and not being against or opposed to meeting with us again sometime for reasons that we haven't driven a wedge between us and them in the name of contending for the faith, if you follow what I'm saying. You see, if we will just adhere to these guidelines, biblical guidelines, as Titus 2.8 read, as we read earlier, the opposition, if you go at contending for the faith properly, the way God tells us to, the opposition will never have any evil thing to say about you. I've had people come to me trying to prove their spiritual point, and I've left that conversation saying they are a jerk. And you want to know what? It's because they acted like a jerk. They deserve to be called a jerk. They were arrogant. They were belligerent. They were hateful. They were in my face. They were jerks, as far as I'm concerned. Do things God's way, the opposition will have no evil thing to say about you. You, stand, you can stand up for truth and in such a way that the enemy will not be able to bring verifiable accusations against you. They might say something evil of you, but it will be false accusation because of you having behaved yourself in a becoming man. They might do so, but they'll have no evil thing to say of you that is true. Contend the opposite way, the manner in which many of today's self-absorbed, combative Christians do it, and evil will be spoken of you. Here is what I'm saying. You want to maintain a good testimony in your contending for the faith? Go about it in a, in a Christ-like manner. Nothing bad will ever be able to be said about you. It will not bring reproach upon your testimony. If something ill is said, it just plain won't be true. And in that case, God will defend you anyway, not to worry. But go about it the other way, in a combative, contrary way. And evil will be spoken of you. And I'm going to say, rightly and justifiably so. If Dave Chicoin this week has a conversation with someone, let's say I'm defending the Bible, let's say I'm defending salvation by grace through faith alone, let's say I'm defending the deity of Christ, any of the fundamental foundational truths of the Word of God, of the doctrines of the Bible, and I get those boxing gloves on and start going at it with someone else and make a fool of myself, and at the end... That person that I've been discussing with goes out and tells all of his buddies that that Dave Chicoin is one arrogant, hateful, belligerent preacher. Guess what? That person will be justifiably and rightly saying that about me. I don't want that testimony. I don't want to contend for the faith in that manner. God forbid that any of us do. Here's what it should look like. Defending the faith. Contending for the faith. Apologetics, if that's the word you like. It should all look more like a friendly discussion instead of a fiery debate. But we don't want to go there because our nature likes a fiery debate, doesn't it? We like seeing, we, maybe you don't go to hockey games or whatever. I grew up in Canada, so hockey was the sport. You want to know why people go to a hockey game? If you know hockey, tell me why. Fights! Thank you. Who said that, by the way? Mark knows exactly what I'm talking about. You go to a hockey game because, man, you're sure hoping they'll whip the gloves off and start pounding each other on the ice. It's exciting to see. Why do people like boxing? I saw in the news where Mike Tyson, he's 60 years old now, is going after this young guy here shortly, right? Man, the, 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 the people will be glued to the television because everybody loves a good fight. Why do you go to a, a NASCAR race? It might be because you like racing and all that, but, you know, in a very disturbing way, when there's a big wreck, it's appealing, isn't it? Our nature likes that kind of stuff. Inside of contending for the faith, our nature would like it to turn into a fiery debate. It should be much more a friendly discussion, this contending for the faith, than turning into a fiery debate. 
But because of our littlest member right there being totally out of control because it's set on fire of hell, instead of being controlled and fired up by the spirit, it turns into a devilish delight. And that's a sad thing. I'll say this. Men and women in the world are already hostile to God, to things of God, to Jesus Christ, and to the truth. Is not the general population out there that we would call the unrighteous, that we would call the wicked, unsaved, unregenerate, are they not, for the most part, pretty hostile toward the things of God? Yes, they are. Let's not us make it worse by us delivering the truth in hostility ourselves. People that are opponents of God are hostile toward God, or else they'd be followers of Him. They're hostile to the things of God. You're only going to make the enemies of the cross more hostile when in your contending for the faith and standing up for Jesus... You're hostile in your man. It's only going to make things worse. One of my friends from Canada posts this on his Facebook page. I texted him and asked him where he got it from. He said he had no idea. And I love it. I've used it for a long time. Truth. Apply it to Bible truth. Truth that is not undergirded by love makes the truth obnoxious and the possessor of it repulsive. Whoever wrote that knows exactly what they're talking about. This is how it plays out. Christian, you can proclaim the word of God, but if it is not undergirded by love and, and brought forth inside of you walking in the spirit of God to the person you're speaking to, to the person you're wanting to... Uh, have listened to you, the truth that you are declaring will be obnoxious to them and you will be repulsive to them. That is how it works. We all know that the weapons of our warfare are not... What? Anybody know? What's it say? The weapons are, of our warfare are not carnal. We all know that, do we not? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, so let's lay down the carnal, corrupt ideas and means and motives and methods of contending for the faith and earnestly contend for the faith the way that God wants us to. So, Christian, fellow church person, contend and defend. Contend and defend, fellow Christian. That's what we're told to do. But do so... In meekness, in lowliness, in humility, in love, in patience, and I'm going to say in perseverance, for to glorify God. And lead those that are in opposition or under some darkness of deception to the truth to come to know the truth so that they too, like you, can be set free.